Hello, guys. Um, I was staying with a friend this morning, um, who I haven't known that long, but I really respect him because he's done some amazing things in the world of diving. And he said, mate, I went on this TED website and uh, there's all these philosophers and scientists and politicians and amazing people who have great things to say about the world. And he's just like, I, I just don't understand why you're, you've been invited to speak today. <laughs> Brilliant. When I, was, when I was your age, when I was at school, I had no idea what I wanted to be. My careers advisor told me that I should do maths. I should follow the grades. I was like, I hate maths. But he said, I'm looking at the piece of paper and you're better at maths than anything else. I was awful at maths. And I said, I'm too young to decide what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm 17. How are you telling me to make a decision now for what I'm going to do in 20 years? I just have no idea. I've got no experience yet. Society is built on blocks. Um, we, I guess we wake up in a box, don't we? And then we pour cereal from a box and we get in a box and go to school or go to work and then we sit in a box and we're kind of in a box now, even though it's kind of egg-shaped. And, oh no, look, this is how I spent my summer. 2,404 miles, stand-up paddleboarding the length of the Mississippi River. It's the first time I'd ever seen the Mississippi. I was basically dressed like a Mexican pirate for three months. <laughs> Everything I needed was in two dry bags, one at the front and one at the back of my board. It was the most simple, wonderful journey. And if you look closely, I even had my own Wilson, who just floated down the river on a tree. So in the 14 years between my careers advisor telling me that I needed to do maths and now making a living from adventure, what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened, but more specifically why it happened and to a smaller degree how as well. Now, I wasted my early 20s, as you can see. It's quite embarrassing showing this photo. Um, recently, <laughs> I graduated with hair like this and a beard wrapped up in elastic bands. My parents were ever so proud. And recently, I had to uh, Photoshop a picture because the photo of my graduation, my brother's, is up in the house. The photo of my graduation isn't. I look like a, a big old rebel. So I had to Photoshop my hair out and my beard out. <laughs> My, my parents have been ever so supportive for what I'm doing, but when I got to this stage, I was 22 when this photo was taken. This was the first five years of my, of my 20s. I feel like I wasted it. Um, I had followed society's path, I guess, the path of what was expected of me. I went to school, I got my A-levels, I went to university, I got my degree, and then I got a job. And after that, I guess you're expected to get a picket fence and a, a mortgage and maybe a long-term partner and some kids and the occasional holiday in between work. But I was constantly suffering from that Sunday fear, the same fear that I had when I was at school. I wasn't looking forward to going to school the next day. I wasn't looking forward to my Monday. And exactly the same was happening in my early 20s when I was working. I'd become a graphic designer and I really wasn't that good at it. Even though I felt like I had something creative deep within me, I just didn't know what that was yet. I hadn't thought about it. By the time I got to the age of 25, I realised that I was depressed. I'd done everything that had ever been expected of me, apart from I hadn't thought about myself. I hadn't thought about my passions. I went snowboarding. I wasn't very good. I spent a week in the snow. But on the way back, I realised that I'd found something, the passion of riding a board that had given me something that I'd never felt before. So I got myself a longboard. I lived in a town, Swansea in South Wales a town that the poet Dylan Thomas said was the graveyard of ambition. And I think the fact that I was a graphic designer and all I wanted to do was go home and sit on my two sofa-sized beanbags and play the PlayStation with my long hair, that made me happy. <coughs> comfort kills ambition like nothing else in our lives. And I was so comfortable and I was depressed. Riding that longboard for the first time changed the vision of a town I'd lived in for six years. And two weeks later, I skated into work and quit my job and skated out, making myself two promises. One, I was never going to work for anybody else again because I wasn't very good at it and it's not fair on any employer. And two, I wanted to skateboard further than anybody else ever had. Because the newness of longboarding had woken me up. I hadn't done anything new for five years. So I wanted to skate a long, long way and every day I'd do something brand new. First of all, though, I needed a warm-up. 
Lived in England, so I decided to skate from John O'Groats to Land's End. As a rookie skateboarder, I could only skate with one leg because I didn't want to fall in front of cars. Um, but it gave me a chance to be creative. Suddenly, I was being creative for myself. I set up a project called Board Free. I skated from John O'Groats to Land's End. I sold my calves as advertising space. £1,000 per calf. Brilliant advertising space, by the way, because it gets bigger with time. I learned to look after myself, to treat blisters, and to deal with the concept of distance, something I'd never done before. On June 2nd, 2006, I got to Land's End. I was the first person to skate the length of Britain, and in total I'd been skating for just over one year. Two months later, I flew out to Australia. Perth to Brisbane, I wanted to do. I'd never been to Australia before. I wasn't sure of what I was going to encounter. I had all the necessary warnings, the snakes and the crocodiles and the people, watch out for the people. But I was a redhead with pale skin and I wanted to skateboard across one of the hottest, most volatile countries in the world. What was I doing? I tell you what, if you want to get out of your comfort zone, try skateboarding four and a half thousand miles in eight months. Wowza. I was a different person after that. And that was a good thing. But it was also something really, really difficult for me to come to grasp with. By the time I'd finished, I realised that I'd achieved something that a couple of years earlier I would never have considered possible for myself. I was physically exhausted. I'd basically skated beyond the capacity of my previous dreams. Psychologically, though, I was even more destroyed. Um, the team that had followed me and supported me all the way across didn't get on, and that was a dark spot in this utopia that I tried to create. For the first time in my life, I'd followed my passions, and it hadn't quite worked out. The team were barely speaking to each other. They certainly weren't speaking to me. So I shrunk away. I was lucky enough to get a book deal, and I wrote about it all. It was a really cathartic process, writing a book, but I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what I was meant to be doing, and I held on to two things. One, I'd managed to skateboard a really long way. I'd managed to skate further than anybody else ever had in one single journey, but was that enough? Just to have an achievement under my belt? I wasn't sure. But the thing that kept me going was that feeling of newness that I got the first time I stepped onto a skateboard. So I continued to do new things. I hadn't had a plan once I got to Brisbane on board. I didn't know what was coming next. It was enough just to get there. So I tried to find a girlfriend by dating 100 women in 100 days. I don't recommend that, by the way. <laughs> and I tried human-powered hydrofoiling. I became the fastest person in Britain on this thing called an aquaskipper, which wasn't hard because I was the only person to try an aquaskipper in Britain. <laughs> but it made me feel good about myself for a short while. And eventually, I realised that I needed to work out what made me tick, what really made me happy. And I started to prioritise my happiness. I had no right to believe that I could make a living out of that. But I believed that I could. Steve Jobs said, you only know that the dots will join up with hindsight. You just have to believe that they're going to. And I believe that if I was going to live my life to the full, then I had to be happy. It was really that simple. Eventually, my heart took me back to Australia, to another journey. Up until then, I'd written one book, and I'd done one adventure. So what was I? Was I an adventurer? Was I an author? I wasn't a graphic designer anymore. I didn't really have an identity. But I felt like adventure and endurance adventures specifically would really test my boundaries, make me test my own limits. So I went back to Oz. By then I'd taught myself to film and edit because I'd realised that at school I wasn't meant to do maths. I was meant to do English or more specifically I was meant to tell stories. And that creative urge that I always felt like I had was coming out in these adventures. Suddenly every day I was doing something brand new and it was so, so exciting. I realised that even though I didn't really know where I was going yet, I'd made a pretty good decision somewhere along the way because my office was now the banks of a river. I'd pull over after a long, hard day, obviously dab the sun cream on, and then I'd edit videos and I'd tweet and I'd write blogs and share my adventures with other people. <coughs> and suddenly I realised, hold on, I, I have an identity now. This is my second adventure and that kind of means maybe, maybe I'm an adventurer. What does that, what does that mean? I still didn't really know where I was going because I didn't have a long-term plan. I drifted after the Murray. But then I got a phone call from a guy called Sebastian Terry, an Australian man who at the age of 27 had written a bucket list called 100 Things, 100 things he'd always wanted to do. 
He'd delivered a baby in a Canadian town called Regina. He'd got a tattoo on his shoulder. He'd planted a tree in Switzerland, bust as Batman in New York. He'd done all kinds of things. He was traveling around the world. And then he called me up April 2010 and said, Dave, I'd like you to help me break a world record. I want to crush more eggs between my big toes than anybody else has in 30 seconds. <laughs> I said, Seb, come and stay with me. I'll, I'll be your egg placer. You know when someone's happy when their eyes are shining bright. And this guy was living life on the edge. Not really because crushing eggs is the most uh, edgy thing you can ever do. Maybe it is. Uh, he is so proud of his Guinness World Record, by the way. Discounts into cafes, he gets girlfriends, all kinds of stuff. He's walking around. But he did it because he said, yes, I'm going to do it. All of you guys could go home, buy some eggs from Asda. Really expensive now, by the way. Not the point. Crush them, get a world record. It's that simple. Seb has it. He's held it for 18 months because he decided to do it. I believe that everybody in this room, everybody on the planet, has a light within them. It starts off quite dim, but that light represents a talent, something that makes us brilliant. We all have it. And sometimes we're lucky enough to have teachers or friends or family who help us to nurture that talent. Sometimes we don't. And therefore we have to work out what it is by ourselves and nurture our own talent. I realized that adventure and storytelling and sharing my adventures was exactly what I was be meant to be doing. But I needed my own bucket list, just like Seb had. So I came up with a long-term concept that would keep me going. And if I had to write a book about a journey, I really had to write it quick after a journey because the next one was coming up fast. Expedition 1000 is the name of my bucket list. 25 journeys, each one at least 1,000 miles in distance, each one using a different form of non-motorized transport. Human power, animal power, natural power. I've done four of them so far. I'll tell you about a couple more in a bit. But first of all, excuses. This is my vicious circle of badness. I know we can all relate to this. These are the excuses that we make to ourselves when faced with an opportunity to do something pretty cool, something life-changing. They're not reasons, they're excuses. I don't have the time, I don't have the money. I'm not fit enough, I have responsibilities. We batter ourselves with these excuses and it comes down to us being scared. We're scared of wasting our time in case we make a mistake. And if you're afraid of making a mistake, you're never ever going to do anything original. And we all have that light within us. That means we can be original, we can do something great. It all comes down to fear. Sebastian and I carried on doing some adventures together and of course now I'm bound by my bucket list which says I have to do at least a thousand miles each journey. We did a speaking tour in Australia and it went down pretty well. We were invited by a company to go over to Vegas and open their annual conference. And Seb said, I'm not flying from Sydney to Vegas just for an hour. It sounds fun, but that's kind of lazy. And I was exactly the same. I'm not going from London to Vegas just for an hour long talk. Let's do an adventure, Seb. So we flew into Vancouver because it started with V just like Vegas and therefore sounded cool. And neither of us had ever ridden a tandem bike before we sat on our tandem bike and headed south to Vegas. 1,400 miles in 14 days, that's all we had. It was a simple mathematical equation. We knew that if we did 100 miles a day on the worst tandem bike possible, despite the fact that we literally fell into America because America, we didn't know how to ride this thing, then we'd get to Vegas on time. We did. But just as we came into Vegas, we spoke to a woman in a gas station. And we realized that distance is just a state of mind. We knew that we could do it. It was simple common sense. We just carry on, cap, carry on pedaling and we're going to get to Vegas. That's fine. The woman at the gas station answered our question, which was, how do we get to the strip? You know, we think it's three miles away or so. And she was like, oh my, the strip's a long way away. I don't think you can cycle there. <laughs> she sounded like Elmo, apparently. Um, we, oh, we were like, we just cycled from Canada. What are you talking about? June 19th this year, um, I faced up to another big fear. Every time uh, I organize an expedition, I, I scare myself. But traveling the length of a river is a great, a great way to put things in, into perspective. You only really truly understand something if you're fully exposed to it. The people at the top of a river will tell you one thing. The people at the bottom will tell you another. Everybody tells you that you're going to die. But you realize that they all have pretty much the same opinion all the way down however much they like to make themselves different. And I only realized that in 2,404 miles, 
stood up. Simple trigonometry is amazing stand-up paddleboarding. It's so, so simple. I'll never kayak again because the view is so much better from these things. Now, you're only ever going to face your fears by facing your fears. I was worried about alligators. I was worried about big water on the Mississippi. And I faced all of these things. I learned every single step of the way, and I do it on every one of my journeys. And we all do. Whatever our journey is, whether we're setting up a business or going on a big endurance expedition, there are stages, and you have to break the distance down bit by bit by bit. And whatever obstacles you face, you just deal with them. Now, I realize every time that I do one of these journeys, I'm just small. There's nothing better for the state of our own egos than to consider exactly how small we are on this planet. It's wonderful, because it takes the pressure off. There was once upon a time when this Earth wasn't here, when there wasn't human life. And there will be a time in the future when there's no human life. And I'm not here to depress you right at the beginning of this inspirational day. But doesn't that just put everything in perspective? Does it really matter if we make mistakes, small mistakes, in pursuit of our happiness? I've learned more from my mistakes than I have from my successes, that's for sure. And I'll continue to make mistakes. But I think I'll continue to be happy if I learn from them. Penultimate slide, my next challenge, to row an ocean. More people have climbed Everest. In fact, the amount of people who've rowed an ocean it's a fraction of the amount of people who climbed Everest. But Everest is seen as the biggest goal on our planet, on planet Earth. But we all have our own Everest. For me, I can't imagine anything harder than crossing an ocean in a six-meter boat by myself. But I love the idea of that challenge. In the middle of the sea, with nothing tangible to hold on to, like you do on a river, you can see the trees passing. You know you're covering ground. In an ocean, I don't know. But I believe I can do it, because if you can travel 10 meters in a way, you can travel 1,000 miles. You can travel 4,000 miles. So this is my bucket list, Expedition 1000. I believe that the essence of life is to test ourselves as much as we possibly can. If you look after yourself, if you prioritize your happiness, if you give yourself a chance to nurture your own talent and you surround yourself with good people. Make a bucket list. Let your light shine and you'll do just fine. Thank you.